Welcome. 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 Is my sound coming through okay? Yep. Fantastic. Uh, hello. Welcome to the first day of the 2021 GIA Annual Conference, Plurality, Power, and Belonging. I'm Eddie Torres, President and CEO of Grandmakers in the Arts. I'm going to do this mostly in English, uh, pero para un momento. Uh, todas las participantes pueden sentirse en la libertad de hablar en su idioma de preferencia durante las actividades de esta sesión. Ofrecemos el servicio de interpretación simultánea en inglés y español durante nuestro, nuestras reuniones y así cada participante puede comunicarse en el idioma con el que se sienta más cómodo gracias al Lingobox. We welcome everyone to speak in their preferred language during this session. We offer a simultaneous interpretation in Spanish and English so that everyone can communicate in the language in which they feel most comfortable. Thank you to Lingo Vox. They are a business in Puerto Rico and we are grateful to be able to work with them. I also wanted to make sure that you knew that closed captions are available during this keynote and throughout the conference. Just go to the bottom of the screen and uh, click on uh, the button that says more, and that will give you the opportunity for closed captions. For interpretation, click on the button next to it that says interpretation, and there'll be a globe over that. Choose your language and then choose mute original. So I want to say, we bring you this conference online after our having had to pivot from a hybrid conference that included an in-person conference in San Juan, Puerto Rico. We regret having had to postpone the in-person conference in Puerto Rico, but we commit to continuing to engage the people of Puerto Rico now until our in-person conference in Puerto Rico in 2023 and forever. I make this commitment as the president of Grant Makers in the Arts, but also as a Puerto Rican. A nuestras colegas en Puerto Rico, ustedes son Toda nuestra familia ahora. I'm coming to you now from my apartment in Queens, New York, standing on the unceded land of the Lenape Muncie people who continue to live and work here. Every community owes its existence and vitality to generations from around the world who contributed their hopes, dreams, and energy to making the history that led to this moment. Some were brought here against their will, some were drawn to leave their distant homes in hopes of a better life and some have lived on this land for more generations than can be counted. Truth and acknowledgement are critical to building mutual respect and connection across all barriers of heritage and difference. We begin this effort to acknowledge what has been buried by honoring the truth. We are standing on the ancestral lands. We pay respect to the elders and people of this land, past and present. Please take a moment to consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that bring us together here today. And please join us in uncovering such truth at any and all convenings at which you present or at which you intend. Please read the GIA Virtual Convening Community, Community Accountability Agreements on the conference section of the GIA website for details on how to show up and remain accountable to your GIA community. And I wanna thank the over 500 grant makers, artists, culture bearers, and workers who are joining us for our conference today and this week. I also want to thank our supporters, the Serdna Foundation, Bloomberg Philanthropies, Lamboyan Arts Fund, the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, the Joyce Foundation, Miranda Family Fund, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, Rockefeller Brothers Fund, the Wallace Foundation, I wanna thank Looking Glass Creative. I wanna thank every one of our volunteers. We love you and I'm so sorry not to be able to give you a big hug. And I also wanna express my love and respect for the GIA team that has made this conference possible. I wanna thank Nadia Lopta, Sherilyn Seeley, Steve Klein, Carmen Graciela Diaz, Sylvia Jung, Champ Connect, George Marfo II, Zoe Williams. And I wanna thank the conference planning committee. I'm not gonna name them all here because they're going to join us throughout this conference. And I wanna start off with a member of the conference planning committee. She is also the vice chair of Grant Makers and the Arts Board of Directors from Denver Arts and Venues, Dariana Navas Nieves. Thank you, Eddie. 
And buenos dias, good morning, everyone, wherever you are across the US and in my beloved island of Puerto Rico. I'm Tariana Navas Nieves, my pronouns are she, her, ella. And I join you today from the land of the Ute Cheyenne and Arapaho people known today as Denver. But I am also from Puerto Rico or Boriquen, meaning land of the brave people. This name was given by the Taino Arawak people of this Caribbean island. My name Tariana, originally Tariana for the Tainos, meaning son, reminds me of who I am, where I am from, no matter where I go or where I am. As Eddie said, I'm the Director of Cultural Affairs for the City and County of Denver for Arts and Venues, uh, as well as member of the Executive Leadership Team for the City's Equity Platform. And I also have the privilege of serving as Vice Chair of Grandmakers in the Arts. And it is my honor today to have a really special opportunity to introduce you to Frances Negron Muntaner, a fellow Puerto Rican who is an award-winning filmmaker, writer, curator, scholar, and professor who I met when she was a young woman and we went to high school together. She currently is a professor at Columbia University where she is the founding director of the Media and Idea Lab and founding curator of the Latino Arts and Activism Archive at Columbia's Rare Books and Manuscripts Library. Among her books and publications are Boricua Pop, Puerto Ricans and the Latinization of American Culture, who received uh, a Choice Award in 2004, The Latino Media Gap and Sovereign Acts Contesting Colonialism in Native Nations in Latinx America. Some of her films include Small City Big Change, War for Guam, and Life Outside. For her work as a scholar and filmmaker, Frances has received Ford Truman, Scripps Howard, Rockefeller, Pew and Chang Shafkin Fellowships. Major funders are probably in the room, such as Social Science Research Council and the Warhol Foundation and Independent Television Service have also supported her work. The United Nations Rapid Response Media Mechanism has recognized her as a global expert in the areas of mass media and Latin American studies. And she is a recipient of the Lenfest Award, one of Columbia University's most prestigious recognitions for excellence in teaching and scholarship. She was the recipient of an inaugural OC Educator Award. Frances is a gifted and kind human, and I ask you to join me in welcoming Frances. Uh, but before I do, I want to share in her own words what I believe captures her artistry and talent, her passion for community, her love of our native land of Puerto Rico, and her bold drive to question systems and create change. Quote, as a child and young adult, I was mostly interested in film for its capacity to engage diverse publics and build community. But eventually I realized that communication is not the only reason to think with and through art and filmmaking. Rather, art practices bring forth knowledge in themselves, which allow us to inquire in a different and necessary way. Lastly, my concerns, questions and method have developed in relation to Puerto Rico's colonial experience and my trajectory as a colonial migrant. Growing up in one of the world's remaining formal colonies, a territory that legally belongs to, but is not part of a country that self-describes as the world's greatest democracy. And later, living in that country for most of my life could not but activate all circuits of questioning. And if that's not inspiring, I don't know what is. So, bienvenida, Frances Negron Montaner. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. I was really thrilled to get your email um, to participate today. I wanna to thank everyone that made it possible. Um, and today, as Tariana hints, I'm gonna talk about the relationship between two things that are very important to me, art and Puerto Rico. My remarks today aim to create new frameworks and think a little bit more about what we mean by infrastructure, as well as circulate little known stories and perspectives to understand our moment. My emphasis stems from understanding that we see not only with our eyes and senses, but also through our concepts and our stories. And what's important about that to underscore is that in our stunningly diverse region of the world, the Americas, most of our concepts and stories 
emerge from a few global North countries. And some of these are stolen, if you will, work beyond recognition to serve entirely different purposes. And to me, this has great repercussions to art and the institutions that fund and show art. So today I'd like to discuss a concept and tell stories from the Puerto Rican archipelago that however I believe will resonate in many other parts of the world, including the United States. I make a small note that in this intervention, I will not talk about Valori Cambio, my 2019 public art intervention, which I also consider part of what the phenomena that I'm describing the arts of catastrophe. Uh, and also produce another concept called decolonial joy, underscoring the ways that we not only apply concepts to art, but that art produces concepts to think with. But if anyone has questions about that other project in the q and I'd be very happy to answer those or engage with that. So I titled my remarks today, Arts of Catastrophe. I'd like to start with this, slide two. On September 30, 2021, the 73-year-old Tina Roosevelt, and I use the Puerto Rican pronunciation for Roosevelt, located in the Eleanor Roosevelt neighborhood of Atorrey, projected its last movie, the Marvel-inspired action flick, Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Seven Rings. In Nuevo Dia, the main local daily produced a video report that showed hundreds of people in line to watch the film and see the lights finally go out. As they waited, some told stories about how going to the Roosevelt was an intergenerational affair. A few lamented the fate that was befalling the theater. Others like me watching the video at home in New York were simply crying and we're losing a part of ourselves. In a sense, there's nothing terribly special about the scene at Roosevelt. During my childhood, it was referred to as un meaito, a cheap movie theater that largely showed all movies or more recent movies after the first tier theaters. From the start, the government designated the empty lot where it was built to be a movie theater or something like it. Its plain concrete architecture resembled an old military airplane hangar, although it's not clear if it was ever one or there was one nearby. Regardless, the Roosevelt was infrastructure that mattered to the neighborhood and to others. For me, it was one of my two cinema paradisos a theater that I went regular first with my young and broke parents who tried to provide affordable entertainment to their children. And later, as I escaped as a teenager with friends in the process of my own self-creation and definition. Like that other Atorrey movie theater, Cine Arte, that has since been demolished, both theaters contributed to my deep love of art, film, and place. This larger meaning of the closure was not lost on the owner of the Roosevelt. When he finally turned the lights out, he succinctly summed up the situation in the following terms. Es el fin de una era. It's the end of an era. Indeed, many eras. The end of the movie theater era, the populist era, the hopeful era, as well as the end of a specific piece of infrastructure, physical, affective, and social that tied small business to a community and its members to each other. While the reasons why the Roosevelt closed are complex, involving the depopulation, competition from streaming, the COVID pandemic mandates, and lack of support for small businesses during the debt crisis, it is, however, emblematic of a much larger transformation of infrastructure in Puerto Rico. As the manager continued, the old infrastructures are going, and this is not the only one. Three, the loss of so many Roosevelt's is a considerable part of what haunts and prompts what I refer to as the arts of catastrophe. Now, this is a concept that I'm starting to craft. So I would call it a concept in motion, which I define as the ways that people, communities, and networks take up the project of life in the ruins of disaster. To the extent that I elaborate the concept from the study of artistic practice, I use the term to refer to two different but often overlapping phenomena. The first meaning refers to the ways that in places such as Puerto Rico, artistic practices and methods have come up to repair or make up for destroyed, discontinued, or devious infrastructure in the context of disasters. A second and intertwined meaning is the plurality of knowledge that emerges from the struggle to live under disastrous conditions. 
In other words, while the art of catastrophe in the singular refers to artistic practices themselves, the arts of catastrophe in the plural constitute a wider range of knowledge to outlive disaster. Neither is an object nor a thing. Rather, they are materialized relations, counter narratives, and aspirations. As it may already be evident, I'm, I'm defining art and catastrophe in different ways than conventionally. For me, the most compelling art practice is a form of research capable of opening new questions and ways of being. As visual artist Fiona Campbell put it, art making is really a research process, an exploration of a meeting of self and world through some form or material or substance, where creative and systemic, systematic work undertaking to increase the stock of knowledge and the use of the stock of knowledge to devise new applications. In a way, it's not that dissimilar or not that different from science. Importantly, Campbell further suggests that there are two ways to conceptualize how art is research. First, there is art making as a search through a problem, a cognitive view, as opposed to it being a phenomenon of emergence, as phenomenologists and other people consider it. The cognitive view emphasizes research are related to a problem, either solving a problem or finding a problem. The paradigm of emergence, however, remits it to a problem that is not anchored on an all-knowing self or that has a, you know, a clear end. In Campbell's terms, in creativity, the self is diffused into the emergent space, becoming part of something else that is not all about oneself and allows something transformative to take place. In other words, art can be described as a creative and transformative mode of inquiry, relying on specific materials and sources, which are both method medium. Equally important, I am not using the term catastrophe as equivalent to disaster. Rather, I'm proposing to build on literary scholar Alexandra Parisic's observation that catastrophe, a term derived from the Greek meaning to overturn, can be understood not as a disaster, but as a moment of overturning in which collective reflection and action are possible. In contrast to the increasingly subscribed collapse of civilization narrative, in the context of climate change, catastrophic praxis, the way I'm defining it, does not assume that disaster will lead to a completely fatal end. It suggests instead that by turning disaster into catastrophe, new forms of knowledge and actions may offer a way out of racial colonial capitalist modernity. By this, I do not mean to deny the possibility of collapse or disaster, but that to act catastrophically is a different political project than simply addressing disaster. In this second part, contextualizing catastrophe, or why, where does this come from? And we can go to the next slide. In a way, to say Puerto Rico is to say catastrophe in the sense that I'm defining it as a colonial possession of two empires for its entire modern history. In Puerto Rico, what I'm calling the art and arts of catastrophe have a long genealogy. Formerly, it includes visual forms such as the poster, graffiti, pastines, and musical genres such as bomba, salsa, and nueva canción. As knowledge, it encompasses the integration of the arts into the acts of protest, organizing, and revitalization, as we heard early on in our session. At the same time, I believe that the current context represents a distinct and different juncture with specific characteristics. To fully understand this present, it is important to briefly mention how, during the more than 120 years of US colonial rule, US capital and state have cohered three different projects, each with their particular infrastructure and relation to prior infrastructure. We can call them sugar-based agriculture or monoculture, industrial, and now neoliberal. During the first US agricultural capital ruining the Hacienda infrastructure to modernize sugarcane production, subordinate the power of the Creole elite and proletarianize the peasantry. In the second, commonly known as Operation Bootstrap, industrial capital let agricultural infrastructure go to ruin and move the center of economic activity to most more urban so zones 
where industrial capital recruited displaced peasants and others to work in factories and expelled thousands of people to work in the US. This design also included the development of the tourist industry and suburban housing. And I'm, I'm, I'm mentioning that because it will come back. And the expansion of safe air transportation that would facilitate the displacement of hundreds of thousands of Puerto Ricans to the United States. Let's go to, uh, uh, well, actually, characterized by shiny luxury condos rather than wooden shacks of the agricultural period. The current neoliberal project is no less brutal. In Puerto Rico, as elsewhere, the political project of neoliberalism is the imposition of what we can call the debt regime, through which finance capital rules over other sectors of capital, colonizing practices and sites where it was absent or restrained before. For instance, in the past, the so-called welfare state and its industrial capital invested in the future productivity of the worker. In neoliberal capital, has time has accelerated in order to cash in at every possible point, which accounts for the privatization and financialization of health, pensions, and education. Student debt, for example, is an emblematic instance of the debt regime. Instead of waiting to profit from future earnings, once students graduate and are employed, finance capital renders the purpose of a young person's life to pay their debt, education, rather than to live, create, and grow. In Puerto Rico, the neoliberal project sped up under Governor Luis Fortuna's administration in 2009 and faced a first crash in the mid-2010s. While the deeper roots of the present debt regime are in the world crisis of the early 1970s, which resulting in a new global model of capitalist accumulation, its immediate trigger locally on the island was the 10 year phase out of section 936 of the US Internal Revenue Code. Congress passed the measure in 1976 to guarantee high profit margins by extending tax breaks to American corporations that operate in Puerto Rico. But in 1996, Congress abolished the tax exemptions to fund an increase in the minimum wage in the US inducing a wave of plant closing, the loss of over 100,000 jobs, and a deeper recession in Puerto Rico than the one experienced in the United States during the same period. In response, all island administrations turned to another tax option to fund government operations and continue with corrupt contracting practices, selling triple exempt bonds issued by Puerto Rico's main public utilities and municipalities that are not subject to local, state, and federal taxes and are largely held by US financial investment firms or uh, so-called vulture or hedge funds. After pursuing the above strategy for nearly a decade, the government debt reached 72 billion in addition to more than 50 billion obligation, pension obligations. In 2015, this outcome prompted then governor Alejandro Garcia Padilla to declare in an unprecedented public address that the debt that Puerto Rico government had was unpayable. Whereas Garcia Padilla's administration hoped that the US government would step in to alleviate the debt, it instead passed a 2016 federal law known as the Puerto Rico Oversight Management and Economic Stability Act, PROMESA, uh, that created an all elected control board whose main goal is to extract debt payment. Although nearly half of Puerto Rico's population was living below the power poverty line in 2016, the board promoted cuts on all of life's fundamentals fundamentals, including health, education, infrastructure, and pension. We can go to the next slide. It is important to underline that despite how the press usually reports the situation, and the next, Puerto Rico's debt crisis is actually not about debt itself. For, yeah. <laughs> Most of the wealthiest nations the slideshow went backwards. Most of the wealthiest nations in the world, such as Japan, the nation state with the highest debt to GDP ratio, and the United States, the nation state with the largest debt, have tremendous amount of debt. There you go, stay there. The main issue is how and who responds to debt. The US federal government, for instance, could have taken measures to alleviate the debt. Up to half of the debt may be unconstitutional, and a significant amount is also made up of staggering interest payments. Interest payment. It is also widely known that national economies that offer investment over austerity recover faster with less impact to the country's more vulnerable sectors. But the US chose to use debt 
as a form of governance to restructure state policies toward privatization, deregulation, and austerity that have changed so much more than what we think of as the economy, such as employment. I will highlight two that are greatly intertwined and explain the catastrophic turn of many art projects, housing and migration. During Operation Bootstrap, the state pursued policies that emptied the island to impose the rhythms and disciplines of industrial capitals, expand Puerto Rico's consumer market for US good and expel surplus labor. The current juncture marks a transition in a different direction. In this context, what is desired is all that finance capital can devour, housing, public spaces, indebted citizens consuming privatized services. Although population expulsion is not a stated objective of the government or the board, policies now also have the effect of removing people to facilitate forms of accumulation that do not require a large number of laborers or even highly educated professionals. In the words of New York-based activist Rosa Clemente, they want to extract the people. They want a Puerto Rico without Puerto Ricans. Next slide, please. If the neoliberal project was well underway, when Hurricane Maria made landfall in Puerto Rico, the speed of emptying that compromised housing and other public infrastructure picked up afterwards as many federal government inactions further propelled the exodus. This included the slow pace of federal deliberation regarding emergency funds and infrastructure, which made it difficult to access medical care among other services. The unprecedented FEMA air and boat lifts that removed people without housing from Puerto Rico to the United States and the junta's rejection of 100 million emergency fund legislation to support municipalities outside of the capital. In this way, the process imposed specific spatial relations and temporality that made Puerto Rican recovery nearly impossible and render a necessity and render migration a necessity while buying time for colonial capital, real estate speculation and restructuring. Equally important, it before the hurricane, Numerous housing units had been abandoned to the owner's inability to pay or sell. Maria destroyed thousands of fragile houses, which further cleared the land, accelerating land and property dispossession. The 20 and 22 laws, theoretically designed to bring foreign investment to Puerto Rico, have turned many areas of the island into frenzied speculation sites. Critically, the removal of people from their homes not only impoverishes, it also nomadizes. This recalls Silvia Federici's observation that the attack on the house is not only a product of financial speculation, it is an attempt to create a workforce that is more mobile. The brutality of the austerity crisis and the post Maria response, however, also expose who, how, and why power is exercised in Puerto Rico. This realization in turn also destroyed colonial narratives that have taken deep hold and have served as key discourse, discursive infrastructure for prior modes of extraction. One of these is that Puerto Rico was not a colony. If before Maria, many members of the pro status quo Partido Popular Democrático still debated rival party leaders, intellectuals, and others regarding that Puerto Rico was a commonwealth, not a colony, this position after austerity and Maria is no longer tenable. Unlike every conceivable, under every conceivable measure, more than 4,000 Puerto Ricans died after Hurricane Maria because their lives did not matter to either as either Puerto Ricans or US nationals or citizens. Next. The abandonment of the state destroyed another powerful myth that Puerto Ricans are lazy and incapable of self-government. As the austerity crisis, hurricane and post-hurricane response destroyed practically everything, including electric infrastructure, housing, roads, and vegetation, and the state failed to assist, people survived on the basis of creating new relations and rebuilding different kinds of infrastructure. The fact that myth and electric poles collapse at the same time allow for new discursive and material infrastructure bent on turning disaster into catastrophe. So let's look, look a, a bit into these infrastructures of the arts of catastrophe. The possibility of arts of catastrophe was then possible by the revelation that, that something that was meant to be hidden, the infra below underneath, had become visible, exposing the colonial capitalist underside of infernus, if you will, that articulated it. In other words, what the hurricane allowed us to do and the austerity crisis is to look what was underneath. In contrast to earlier periods in Puerto Rico where people perceived the erection of infrastructure as a sign of modern progress, 
the peeling back of rendering naked of infrastructure ushered a kind of infra politics defined in different terms in anthropologist James Scott. If for Scott, the infra politics are the acts, gestures, and thoughts that are not quite political enough to be perceived as such, the infrastructure, the infra politics of the arts of catastrophe literally come from below through an encounter of what lies beneath. It also comes with reckoning which has been destroyed and no longer permits the connection be part, between parts of the infrastructure. In this process, art institutions and artists were not spared and many faced some of the same challenges as other people. They witnessed the partial destruction of art venues due to the hurricane and the 3000 earthquake swarm that shook the island from 2019 to 2020, in which one of the most important art venues and most of the Ponce suffered damages. Individual artists also lost work and places of work. A well-documented case is that of painter and sculptor Celia Sanchez after Hurricane Maria. In the weeks of destruction and loss, artists and art methods emerged with greater force to imagine, build, and sustain infrastructure. Art became less a practice that was contained in a certain type of differentiated infrastructure, such as a museum, than one that itself became infrastructure in various ways for a wide range of purposes and needs. In some cases, art venues form part of the process of building, showcasing, or visualizing alternative infrastructure, not only for artists, but for everyone. Here, the infrastructure for showing or sharing art is also part of the process to transform how art is possible. An important example of this is the Cine Solar Initiative at Casa Pueblo, a nonprofit organization in the mountain municipality of Juntas. Through their solar theater, which is also an itinerant movie house, Casa Pueblo provides a space for independent filmmakers to show their work and interact with audiences while providing theater infrastructure in a town with no commercial movie theaters and abandoned historic movie theater structures. At the same time, Cine Solar is a site that seeks to transition at Juntas from fossil fuels to renewable power, a process that has already succeeding, succeeded in producing what you could call solar citizens committed not to the colonial capital state, but to the principle of energy autonomy and community self-governance and autogestion. There is an uh, image of that uh, if you move forward. If Casa Pueblo is the clearest intervention in integrating multiple arts, keep going, such as film and architecture to found new infrastructure, the most ubiquitous art practice, keep going, seeking to reshape infrastructure is public art. In this case, murals are mobilized against capital to affirm community boundaries and challenge the general emptying logic of neoliberal colonial capitalism. This strategy is certainly not specific to Puerto Rico and Puerto Ricans have a long tradition of urban art, both on the island and the diaspora before the crisis. Yet the staging of urban art festivals such as Santurce's Ley, organized by the Union of Independent Art, and Los Muros Hablan, led by cultural entrepreneurs in Puerto Rico and the diaspora, have turned San Juan into one of the top mural capitals of the world. Unlike other cities, Puerto Rican murals tend to cover all or nearly all of the structure, and its themes are almost always political. You can keep moving forward. While there are murals almost everywhere on the island, certain areas of the capital, such as Santurce, one of the most affected by abandonment and financial speculation, stay there, have the highest density. An emblematic example is La Pandilla 2014 by Alexis Diaz, located in the Diego Avenue in Santurce, featuring the skull of a jibaro or mountain peasant. As signified by his straw hat, the pava, the mural incites the passerby to see how the displacement of Puerto Ricans from the countryside to the slums of San Juan and the United States have hollowed out our insides. The inclusion of a line by poet Julia de Burgos in a letter written to her sister Consuelo when the writer lived in New York in 1942 underscores that the struggle over the streets of Santurce is one between life and death. It says, dejarse vencer por la vida es peor que dejarse vencer por la muerte. To be vanquished by life is worse than to be vanquished by death. Moreover, not only does San Juan have one of the highest number of murals per square mile, it also attracts supported mural artists from outside of the archipelago, such as the Belgian muralist Roa. You can go on. Roa, one of, um, most uh, one of Roa's most photographed murals is that of an iguana holding or strangling a small frog, the coqui. Part of a larger project of visualizing endangered indigenous species, Roa's rendition of a dragon-like iguana, a species not native to the island, overpowering the native coqui 
invites to consider the impact of US capital and hundreds of millionaires moving to the island to escape paying their fair share of taxes. The impact of Roa, another renowned muralist, is then twofold. As other muralists, they made Puerto Rico notice infrastructure and its potential to be more than ruins. They also visualized the dead and austerity crisis for a global audience. In addition to placing art on buildings, placemaking strategies include another form of infrastructure disobedience, the direct takeover of buildings in what urbanist Marina Moscoso Arabia calls a third wave of land and property occupation across the island. Although the exact number of takeovers are unknown, I'm trying to figure them out, but still not there, several prominent grassroots organizations have occupied infrastructure, including Proyecto Enlace and G8 in the Caño Martin Peña, Aquí Vive Gente in Puerta Tierra, and the Taller Comunidad Lagorico in Santurce. You can move forward. A less known example that illustrates the multiple registers of the arts of catastrophe took place in the mountain town of Lares. There, move forward, in 2018, a group of seven displaced families occupied a school that had been abandoned for three years without permission from state authorities. The new residents, combining several placemaking practices, turned the school into a housing complex, next slide, capable of growing food, raising animals, creating a catering business, building a coffee shop, and creating art they can sell. In their strategies and values, these practices evoke the notion of place against empire, theorized by scholar Glenn Coldhart in the context of indigenous political practice. For Coldhart, what is distinctive about indigenous decolonial politics is the emphasis on place as a way to think about reciprocal relationship between peoples, nations, and the environment. In Coldhart's words, it is a profound misunderstanding to think of land or place as simply some material object of profound importance to indigenous cultures, although it is this too. Instead, it ought to be understood as a field of relationships of things to each other. Place is a way of knowing, experiencing, and relating with the world. And these ways of knowing often guide forms of resistance to power relations that threaten to erase or destroy our sense of place. They are likewise similar to sociologist Saskia Sassen's notion of estamos presente, we are present, a gesture of defiance to combat the emptying of the finance control city, which is common in debt and austerity crisis context. This next section, I'm gonna emphasize another dimension of art. I'm calling this section public archives. And we can move to the next slide. Apart from placemaking, and our, our projects are increasingly serve as alternative journalism. As our historian Bettina Perez has argued, and it, this, this essay will be in the upcoming Art Margins um, special edition, the close ties between the government, capital, and the mainstream media produce unreliable news that most people do not trust and largely serve to advance elite interest. To address this, groups such as Colectivo de la Puerta make use of city walls to generate alternative headlines to mainstream media. Let's see the next one. Although ephemeral, the compelling visual qualities of their work allow these interventions to circulate widely on social media and in the physical landscape. As Pérez has written, the artists participate in a form of archiving political and colonial neglect inflicted on the archipelago but poorly documented in mainstream news and media sources. A paradigmatic example is the collective desaturating of the Puerto Rican flag, which we just saw a minute ago, as black and white rather than red, white, and blue, which, by the way, are also the colors of the American flag. And one of the reasons that Puerto Rico has those colors is because it was modeled in the Cuban flag, which in turn was modeled in the Texas flag, and so forth. Another key moment is, is their mural that, that we're looking at right now, Puerto Rico, cuando entenderás que nos usan, using the um, acronym for the US, USA, um, that also means using in Spanish. As uh, Perez suggests, art also serves as public archives. To a large extent, this is the case because in addition to the limitations of the press, the austerity regime and post Maria crisis has also sought to eradicate archives, libraries, and statistics centers, among other repositories. In 2020, the Junta attempted to defund the Puerto Rico National Archives, and the Catholic Archdiocese sold the Seminario of San Ildefonso historic building that houses the Centro de Estudio Javan South de Puerto Rico del Caribe, including its library in Old San Juan. These closures are, and, and sales are attacks not only on the ability to carry out research, but the capacity to link past, present, and future in a collective narrative, however contested. 
In this context, art and artists have stepped in to create archives that document, record, and commemorate current struggles and provide links between the present and the past. Revealingly, this work, particularly those documented buildings and landscape, have not received the attention or distribution opportunities as the beautiful photographs of Cuba's crumbling infrastructures have received over the last decades. Let's see that. Not only is the US, I mean, the reasons for this difference are many. Not only is the US directly and contemporaneously in implicated in the Puerto Rico ruins, but also many artists have deliberately distanced themselves from this type of aestheticized representation. An example of this type of work is photojournalist Oscar Robles, who has spent a decade documenting Santurce. Let's take a look at Robles. Much of Robles' work is concerned with the state of physical infrastructure itself. Images such as Santurce 2014 act as an unadorned record of Santurce's state of abandonment. Whereas one could read this aesthetics as realist or mundane even. No, nope, you're going way too fast. They also constitute a counter aesthetic to the ruined porn that has mediated the representation of Havana and other capitals, but the glossy images of developers who are increasingly building luxury condominiums. Equally important, Robles is interested in the people who in inhabit Santurce. Less concerned with beauty as a classical value than presence, Robles sees how life continues among the ruins and seeks to render their lives discarded by capital visible. Next slide. An emblematic example is Venta Inovia, where a young Dominican black woman appears in the threshold of her house dressed in a wedding gown. At this point, when Santurce is experiencing a significant wave of gentrification, Robles deliberately slow work created over a decade produces a reference point where it's not possible to visualize the, neo the neoliberal luxury developments as progress or improvements. Rather, this new infrastructure tells a story of neoliberal profit, expulsion, and resistance of those residents that stayed regardless of state abandonment. It also makes it abundantly clear that infrastructure is never just an object, but the most visual materialization of social relations, whose presence is defined as much by its materials and functions as the aggregate of forces that allow it to exist. Acting on a similar impulse to its archive, but with a significant different goal and aesthetic, is multimedia artist Sarabel Santos, who has produced hundreds of photographs that she presents in square-like, tile-like shapes. Let's see that. Taken in multiple locations after Hurricane Maria for over 100 days, Santos gravitates to the poetics of discarded objects and the ways these beg the question of what happened, to whom, and why. Let's see the next. In being irremediably in place, her work also calls attention to the instability of presence and to the fact that these traces are neither garbage or natural, but rather the available elements from which a new society can be assembled. In addition to creating archives that document what is ruined, vanished, or reconfigured, art has also taken some of the state's traditional functions, such as memorialization, through semi-permanent and ephemeral, ephemeral mo monuments. Among the most significant intervention was the shoe performance in front of the Capitol on June 8, 1, 2018. Co-organized by artists, artisans, and activists, the work consists of hundreds of shoes that belonged to people that had perished during or right after Maria. The work was a direct rebuttal to the U.S. government claim that only 64 people had died as a result of Hurricane Maria. Using an alternative source, a Harvard study that put the figure at 4,645, organizers sought to create a visual archive and counter narrative that called into question the state statistics and assured that every person who died was counted. Even Puerto Rico having shoes has been a sign of modernity and progress since the late 19th century. To displace the shoes of the dead can be understood as a double loss of loved ones and of the hope of colonial capitalist modernity. As the work of some muralists and organizations, this protest was as much designed to be a vigil for island communities to publicly grieve as to cite US government in action and to reframe Puerto Rico's dead as a crime of state. To this end, the performance cites at least two other contexts, a shoe protest in Washington against gun violence organized just a month earlier, which in turn referenced the then recent Parkland killing of 17 people in Florida. See that. Um, the Puerto Rican organizers, um, use of the term genocide, however, connects it to another public memorialization of law through footwear, Shoes on the Danube. On bail in 2005, this public sculpture in Budapest, Hungary, displays 60 pairs of shoes to mark the site where fascist arrow cross militiamen shot Jews and threw their bodies into the river in 1944 and 1945. As in Budapest, the Maria Shoe Memorial, while ephemeral, 
sought to reconfigure narrative and memory. So our infra selves or the ultimate end game of the arts of catastrophe. Although to date, I have emphasized the ways that the arts of catastrophe redress physical infrastructure. At the same time, they are extending the notion of infrastructure to subjectivity itself inside us. That is, whereas the work of infrastructure to meeting needs such as energy, shelter, and education, the arts of catastrophe are ultimately about reconfiguring subjectivity by building new effective infrastructures. That is, not organized through colonial capitalist logics. In this context, the arts of catastrophe are also a site to raise a series of questions that are generally not raised elsewhere, but have enormous political consequences. What are the affects of indebtedness? What is the relationship between the insides, our effective infrastructures, and the outsides, our physical infrastructures? What are the limits of even the arts of catastrophe in addressing these questions? To further think about this, I'd like to conclude with Adal's 2016 photography series, Puerto Ricans Underwater. In this project, Adal individually photographs over 100 people drowning in what else, a tub filled with water. In this way, Adal suggests a two paths to consider the complexity of effective infrastructure. On the one hand, the photographs showcase a tremendous effective diversity. Although all of Adal's subjects are in the same circumstances, confined and immobilized, each defies death and debt in their own unique way. Among other things, they scream, they smoke, they exercise, sleep, play the trumpet, take photographs, strike a pose. On the other hand, Adal compellingly demonstrates the power of artistic practice to unsettle the very terms of the crisis and call them into question. Let's go to the third one of these, that one. This is manifest in the portrait of Bold Destro, a young man wearing a red ski mac and black t-shirt that reads Muerto Rico. The phrase immediately begs a series of questions. Is this a photograph of a rich dead man, a dead man who is attractive or a portrait of a dying Puerto Rican that is nevertheless alive with attitude and creativity? The diversity of responses and each image's polysemy suggests that what constitutes the debt or disaster more generally can likewise be read in different, in different ways that may not always be articulated as part of the same infrastructure, including that it is ridiculous, not only unpayable. From this point of view, the debt crisis is an invitation for creative insurrections and political disruptions and vice versa. This suggests that as productive as they can be, the art of catastrophe are less an answer to a problem than a method to dig, do, and descent through the always mutating and uncertain path of disaster. In this sense, it is important to underscore that the emergence of new, better, or more radical forms of infrastructure often cannot and do not make up for some of the losses. Not all that has been lost can be repaired or repurposed. Not all will return. This old infrastructure, many times rooted and loved by communities, is dismantled by economic and political forces rather than repurposed or incorporated in so showing for the reproduction of memory and communal bonds. At the same time, the arts of catastrophe define as signifying ways groups develop to retain a sense of place, memory, and community may be the most fundamental if fragile infrastructure of all, which is why our support of these arts is essential, not only for art, but for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Gracias a Francis Negron Montaner. Thank you so much. I am so grateful that we will be able to begin this process with you. Um, it's really essential that we make clear not only that we need to invest in Puerto Rico's cultural community, but that the circumstances in Puerto Rico are not natural. They are the result of United States fiscal policy and that we need to not only increase philanthropic investment in Puerto Rico, which we do need to do, but we also have to use our social capital and our political capital to advocate for changes in public policy. Uh, well, I can't think of a better way to have begun this conference. So again, thank you, Francis Negron Montaner. That was fantastic. We have a full day ahead of us. Um, if we could share the schedule, we have our closing, uh, we have two, uh, one hour session blocks coming next, and we are closing with another keynote from Las Nietas de Nono at 5.45 Atlantic Standard Time. Please be sure to familiar, 
familiarize yourself with Attendify, which is where you'll access the sessions, the keynotes, the roundtables. And I also want to take a moment to again say thank you. Thank you to our sponsors, Cerdna Foundation, Bloomberg Philanthropies, Flamboyant Arts Fund, the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, the Joyce Foundation, Miranda Family Fund, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, Rockefeller Brothers Fund, the Wallace Foundation. I want to thank the team at Looking Glass Creative. I want to thank the team of interpreters and captioners at LingoVox. They're all working behind the scenes to making this process smooth and enjoyable. I again want to thank all of our volunteers. Thank you. We love you. And I again want to offer my love and respect for the grant makers and the arts team that have made all of this possible. And thank you to all of you, the 500 plus uh, artists, uh, uh, arts funders, cultural workers who are joining us uh, this week. I am so excited to spend the rest of this week with you. So thank you. I'm looking forward to seeing you in a few.